Okay, so welcome to the International Center of Medieval Arts Mentoring session for CVs and job applications. I'm Regan Martin, the coordinator for digital engagement for the ICMA, um, and I'm very excited to introduce you to our panelists. Um, each will give brief remarks and then we'll open it up for informal discussion. So please be uh, ready with your questions. And if for any reason you would like to pose your question in the chat, I'll be monitoring that as well. So feel free um, to pose your questions there also. Um, so our first panelist will be Dorlin Pines. Uh, Dorlin Pines was the Associate Director of, for Administration at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and previously the Chief Librarian of the Watson Library, also at the Met. She is currently involved with recruiting for nonprofit organizations as part of the Development Consulting Group. She earned a PhD from Columbia in late medieval and early Renaissance art and is chair of the Friends of the ICMA. So thank you so much, Dorlin, for being with us. I should, <clears throat> excuse me, unmute myself. Um, so uh, the Friends of ICMA, by the way, is really the development committee. We just didn't want to call it the development committee, but uh, when things get better, we will resume some events and hope to see some of you there. So I um, unfortunately may have to leave a little bit on the early side, which is why I'm going first. And I'm going to be talking about and answering, happy to answer any questions about people, any of the people here who would like to work in a museum. Um, there isn't always a straight path to a museum, but certainly on a resume, one needs to have um, not only uh, obviously expressed interest in working in a museum, but have had a, a fair amount of experience, um, admittedly at a somewhat junior level to work in a museum. So if there's no museum experience at all, uh, a museum is not gonna not hire you, but I think might, might pass. Um, so it doesn't mean you can't go off in two directions, teaching and museum at the same time, but certainly, as I said, one needs to have expressed some sort of interest and had some experience. One way to get that experience aside from you know, experience in college or graduate school or whatever, um, is uh, there are all several museums, usually the larger ones, and I suspect some of the smaller ones as well, have fellowships um, that you can do, you know, for a couple of months or a year or, or a summer or whatever. And that's a way also for people in whatever department you may be interested in working in will we'll get to know you. And then when there is an opening, they will think about you. Also, the Mellon Foundation has curatorial fellowships in several museums, which is a good way to start. It, it was something that they did a couple of years ago, I'd say at this point, it's probably 10 or 11 years ago, to get people who were on the academic path to think about museum work. And it's again, a really good way to get to know about a museum. I mean, there's certainly, they don't make you sign say, something saying, yeah, if you got this fellowship, you have to work in a museum. It doesn't work that way. They, you know, they can't make you do that. Um, but it sort of opens up a world that people may not be as familiar with. Um, certainly working in a larger museum, um, they will often hire from, from a smaller museum, say in a, you know, in a more junior position, working one's way up. So it works in, in both ways. I mean, certainly my path, and I um, was not a curator, although I did have uh, the curators and the conservators and the registrar and the libraries and, you know, all kinds of departments reporting to me. Um, so I was, you know, very, very well versed in, in, in curatorial work. Um, but there, there are all kinds of unusual pasts. I mean, I actually happened to also have a library degree. And so I went to work in the library. And I think when the director was looking for someone to take over as the associate director of administration, um, I was recommended by the person who had been my prior boss. And I think they were looking for someone who had management and administrative experience. So that kind of experience is also helpful. Financial experience is also not going to work in a hedge fund or anything like that, but learning how to read a spreadsheet and putting together a budget and working with donors and working with development departments, all of these things really contribute to a successful uh, curator slash museum staff person. And the other thing to think about is that there are a lot of, of positions in museums, particularly the larger ones, that are not necessarily curatorial. Um, so there are you know, enormous numbers of jobs uh, that one can do in a museum. Uh, is, 
you know, something else, something else to think about. So I think we, we had a few resumes that came to us early um, and, you know, out of, it was a pretty small group and, and I think there were only two people who were interested, who expressed an interest in working in a museum and both of them did have a, you know, a, a nice amount of, of museum experience. So I think they were kind of on the right path if that's something that they wanted to do. So I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very Hi. much. I think if it's okay, we'll just save all the questions um, for the end and let each panelist introduce themselves. Sorry to cut you off there. Karen. No, that's okay. It's just that, you know, I, I do oh, have, to, have leave to leave by off. four. Yes, that's right. That, okay. that was the only thing. Um, so, you know, I don't know how long we were going to go on, but I will have to run out at four. So okay. Okay. if you're okay with that, and um, we will keep if there are any questions. Eye, close eye on the time. Okay. Okay, our second panelist is Asa Mittman, who is Professor of Arts and Art History at California State University, Chico, where he teaches ancient and medieval arts. He has just finished a four-year term as department chair in which he was responsible for all lecture hires. And he has also served on several tenure track hiring committees. Oh, hi everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, so uh, having done this from both sides of the equation numerous times. I applied for a million jobs over several years while I was seeking a permanent position. Um, I mean, if you can imagine such a thing, I applied for, I think, 35 jobs one year. That means there were 35 jobs in one year. Um, to be clear, I was certainly not a great candidate for most of them. Um, but uh, there you go, you know, I just threw any, you know, through whatever they say, throw stuff at a wall and see what sticks. Um, but I, once I started serving on hiring committees, I realized some of the reasons I did not get several jobs I thought I was great for. I thought, you know, I put together an excellent application pack. So like, why don't they want me? I'm perfect for this job. And then on the other side of the table, I think back to, and I actually dug out some of my old job letters and CVs. Thought, oh my God, no wonder I didn't get a job then. Um, so um, I'm hoping that my experience through that could be of help to, uh, to some of you. So the key thing to bear in mind, so I'm at a teaching institution primarily. I mean, the research profiles of everyone everywhere are going up, um, you know, so because there are so, uh, you know, there's so many wonderfully overqualified candidates or qualified candidates for every job, um, but, the teaching schools like Chico State, it's a mid-size sort of mid-level state institution like many, many schools throughout the country. Um, it is not like the schools where I went and the schools where I got my degree and the schools where probably most of you are getting degrees because if you're at a PhD granting institution, you're at a research institution, you know, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not. We have a very, very small terminal MA program. Small but strong. Um, so, in a context like Chico State, which as I say, is replicable all across the country, the faculty are, generally speaking, incredibly uh, busy, highly overworked, fairly exhausted. And when they get um, a stack of applications for a job, uh, they're gonna see, I mean, we saw for each job that we posted, usually something between 60 and 120 applications. Um, some, you know, if you're hiring for modern, it goes up. If you're hiring for medieval, it goes down because the pools are different, you know. But um, what you want when you're looking at those, I firmly believe, having discussed this with several colleagues along the way in doing these, is you want two things to be immediately present. First off, and this is the absolute most important thing, is everything has to just be crystal clear. There can't be any confusion or doubt or ambiguity. I remember reading one application in a recent cycle where I couldn't tell if the person had the PhD or not. And I thought, why am I guessing, right? So I've got 60 here where I know they have it. I have five here where they clearly stated they didn't. I have this one where I can't tell, next, right? So you wanna be absolutely clear about what you're applying for, what your qualifications are for that, what degrees you have or don't yet have, what you 
uh, what awards you have or don't yet have, what publications you have or have in process and uh, where they are in that process. Clarity, clarity, clarity. Um, and one of the reasons, or maybe the main reason that clarity is so important, and I say this with an acknowledgement that this is slightly painful information, but all of these materials are designed to be skimmed. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they don't have to be well-crafted because people are just glancing over them. It means they have to be really, really well-crafted because people are only glancing over them on the first go, right? Because your goal when you're sitting down with 100 applications is to get down to 50. And your goal when you sit with 50 is to get down to 20. Your goal with 20 is to get down to a dozen, right? And though you're going to read it more and more carefully each time. But to make that first cut, you got to be super crystal clear about everything because people are just going to be glancing. Everybody does it differently. I read the CVs first before I look at the job letters uh, because the CV usually just tells me like, has the degree, went here, did this, wrote this, spoke at these things. Um, and then if that all looks promising, then I can hear them explain why they're excited about those things. Um, I have colleagues though, who always start with a letter and only look at the CV if they like that. You know, What that means, they're equally important, right? Because you don't know where people are going to be starting. Um, so uh, so clarity is the number one thing. And the number two thing is that it's got to be clear that you understand where you are applying. Um, and that's the error that I made. So I wrote like these highfalutin uh, explanations of my theoretical approaches to this, that, and the other thing to places where I would be teaching giant introductory surveys of art appreciation to non-major freshmen, right? And they don't really care, you know, who my methodological influences are. They care, can I teach? Am I good in the classroom? Do I have experience in that? Um, and that, uh, so know, know the kind of school you're applying to and the specifics of that school. Um, and then the third thing, which I think dovetails with both of these, as I said, everybody at these schools is busy, has a ton going on um, and doesn't have a huge amount of time. If you're applying to a teaching school, what they really want to know is that you've got some experience doing that, you have some sense of how to do that. And so I would encourage you to all, if that's your goal, seek out those experiences as much as you possibly can. Because the other thing that people are looking for generally is kind of, they're looking for a colleague out of the box, not a student they can mentor into a colleague. They want a colleague because that's what they need. They're replacing probably some senior person who's retired right? And they want somebody who can show up on day one and start. Yes, we're all delighted to work with our junior colleagues. It's huge fun to get to know new people. They bring a new energy, talk with them about their courses and their curriculum. But they, but that's collegial conversation, not training, right? So nobody wants to have to train their new junior colleagues. They want those people to come, plug in, and be ready to run. Um, so those are my sort of main top level things. Clarity, know what kind of place you're applying to, and present yourself insofar as you reasonably and honestly can. I didn't bother to point out honesty is necessary on these. We have seen occasionally people who lie on these things. It's a disaster. Don't do it. Uh, so clarity. Um, knowledge of what kind of place you're applying to, and then presenting yourself out of the gate as a professional rather than as a student who hopes to become a professional. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Excellent, thank you so much, Asa. So our final panelist is Susan Boynton, who is professor of music, historical musicology at Columbia University, and currently serves as co-editor of GESTA, while chairing the Department of Music in 2014 to 18, she was responsible for faculty hires. In addition, she has been a chair or a member of several search committees in music and other disciplines. Uh, thank you so much, Susan, for being with us. Hi, um, I pre-circulated a handout, which I'm not going to go through, but it was so that people have a few points that I would have made you know, if we had a longer session. And I want to re reiterate and 
emphasize also some of the things that my colleagues have said um, about clarity. Clarity is very important. So I looked at the CVs that were sent to us in advance, and I'm going to be communicating with the, the people who sent those CVs with little comments. And I felt we, I think all of us who looked at them thought they were, um, they were pretty good. Um, there always are things to be aware of when you build your CV and you continue refining it and it, your CV grows. One thing is the whole question of what it means for work to be um, that's not published yet. How do you define that work? What are the terms? And so um, Reagan very kindly sent us a link from the Newberry Library with definitions of terms. And these are things I think to, for everybody to pay attention to because I've found over, over many, many years that they're sometimes not, not clear. And it's not that people want to dissemble or misrepresent themselves, but it can come across that way at times. And you have to also remember that what you put on your CV should match what you have on any external website, whether it's academia.edu or an institutional website, because sometimes people don't update them or they don't clarify them. So for instance, if you say something's in progress, what that means is it's not yet completed or submitted. And I would actually advise people to steer clear of listing a lot of things as being in progress when they wanna, it looks as if, it looks to a, say a, a more skeptical observer that um, it looks as if you're trying to pad your CV with things because you think you don't have enough on your CV. In progress is, is very vague. Um, there are certain circumstances in which in the future, you know, you may need to specify what you have in progress because people will ask you or it'll be an expectation, but I wouldn't make a habit of listing a lot of things as being in progress. Then um, if you have something submitted, what it means is that you have sent it and there have been cases where people have said they've submitted something that they hadn't actually yet submitted. So don't do that either, but submit something. It means it's submitted. So it is being reviewed by a publisher or a journal. Um, that's different from accepted. Never say that something is, you know, forthcoming or anything like that when all you've done is send it to a journal. Forthcoming doesn't mean, you know, I've written this thing and I'm sure that someday it's going to get published. That's not what forthcoming means. I, I, forthcoming means that it's, it's actually in press. Forthcoming means it is through the process, you have a date of publication, it's for sure it's coming out. Um, and, and forthcoming is a, it really should be used very sparingly. So um, accepted means that you, you, know, you have an official acceptance from a publisher, from a journal, and you are revising it, but you know it's absolutely for sure been accepted for publication. And in press means that it's in the production process, it's in the pipeline. So it is, for instance, the editors are editing it, or it is being, it's in proof. You can also specify in proof. If you have a book that's not out yet and you really wanna make it clear that your book is, or your article, is coming out soon, you can say in, in page proofs or in proof. Um, but in press is a good way of conveying that something that isn't yet available, because this can sometimes take a year to a year and a half that something is in press. It's a good way of, of specifying that it's um, going to be available and that it's for sure coming out. Um, keeping in mind that publication times are very, very long and everybody knows this, but it's just really important to, to stay absolutely clear just the way we heard it's crucial to make it clear if you have a PhD or not, it's crucial to make it clear if the thing that you've written and are publishing, you know, when it's coming out, where it's coming, you know, if you're sure where it's coming out and so on. Um, and so if you, if you stay with things that are really absolutely um, substantial and substantiated, then your CV will never look as if you're trying to fill it up with extra stuff that's, that may not really be as impressive as, uh, as you want it to be. Um, when you're writing a job letter, I would also reiterate um, what a submitment said, which is you, you really wanna know what the institution wants. So for instance, if you are applying to a teaching school, you look up their classes on the website, you know, you make part of your strategy to understand who's teaching there, what are they teaching? So maybe if you're gonna mention classes that you'd be glad to teach, don't mention classes that they already have in the catalog. Um, I mean, obviously you might need to pay to go for survey classes, but if you wanna mention special topics classes, try to think about ways in which what you're doing could add to the institution and, and think about, again, begin the letter with your teaching interests and your teaching philosophy and your experience if it's a teaching school and, and then follow that with your research always explained in a way that any 
well-educated person could understand what you're talking about. Um, or if it's a research position, you know, at a, at a, at a research university, then make it clear that you uh, start out with your research, but make it clear that you are interested in teaching. And because these days, no matter how lofty the institution, no matter how selective, no matter how, you know, superlative, everybody wants somebody who's interested in teaching. So um, you want to then follow with a paragraph about your teaching experience and your interests and what you particularly liked. I have to say, I don't want to talk too long and I'm, a, I'm conscious of the time. One thing that bothers me personally when I read letters is people who say, who, who seem to have been encouraged to write the letter in a way that says something along the lines of, I will be, I am a perfect fit for this job, literally stating it that way, that, that sort of crassly. And things like, I will bring, you know, I will. Now, clearly we understand that everybody wants to show the contribution they're gonna make. But the, re the, the reason to spend time writing the letter and editing it and, and, and refining it is that you wanna make that come out of the letter, but you don't wanna state it in a way that kind of seems a little arrogant to, to the reader. Um, so that's why I think it's, it's crucially important to show your letter to recommenders. Um, if you're asking a person to write a letter of recommendation for you, you must send them your CV and your job and your application letter. You must do that in advance. And also, if you have a mentor, um, someone you feel you can send a lot of things to, ask them to ask ask more. If you have, say, a, a peer, somebody else who got a job already, um, or a postdoc, um, if, if you could ask that person to look at the letter for you, and and just see if you can get feedback and really remember how important the, both clarity and rhetoric is in the letter. Um, I wanted to mention that. Um, the many of the searches these days are actually for what are called postdoctoral positions, not for tenure track positions. I just say there are there are tenure track positions, but to a to a you know thousand times more than when I was a student, um, there are searches that are for positions that are basically either renewable lecturer positions, although they're not always called that, or postdoctoral positions, which may be for one year, two years, or three years. So you're often applying for a job where um, you need to become part of a department community. You need to show that you, what, what you can do for that department, but you may not be there forever. And um, you don't have to distinguish explicitly between those in writing a letter, but to keep in mind that uh, it's very important to know what the requirements of the position are. And it's very important to to, to understand what it is you're actually presenting yourself as, as Professor Mitten already said, you, you have to understand what it is that you're qualified for. Um, and, and to think about the fact that there's, there are big differences you know, between, between different institutions. And that said, many things that are called postdoctoral fellowships require teaching. So keep that in mind also, because often you'll be asked to specify a specific, to, to present a specific course outline or something like that, uh, or course proposal. And um, you, you wanna make sure you know what are the requirements, both teaching and research wise of your position. And finally, the last word, just to kind of reinforce one more time, how crucially important it is to clarify the date um, by which you either have finished or will have finished uh, your PhD, because some many positions that I've been personally involved in searches where there was an absolutely clear requirement stated numerous times, even in the whites of the eyes of the applicant that the degree had to be awarded by a certain date and or the defense had to be by a certain date. And then later on, things went kind of south and the person would say, well, I didn't realize it was a serious requirement or something like that. So there are many, many, many institutions now, including you know Columbia, which is an Ivy League school where they cannot appoint people um, unless they've met those requirements, say to have the PhD. Things used to be more flexible. And you know, the fact of the matter is if things aren't flexible, you, you need to meet the requirements that, of the position. So always being very, very clear. For instance, you could state in your letter, not in your CV, um, but you could state in your letter, the, the scheduled date of your dissertation defense is one idea. Um, or I have written four of the five chapters of my dissertation um, the fifth one is in draft, or uh, my entire committee has approved three out of the five chapters of my dissertation. Another one has been submitted to my doctoral advisor and the fifth one is in draft or something like that is, is 
I think, important to communicate clearly about the stage at which your work is. So that's all I have to say.